the study of uh, of First Corinthians, the tenth chapter, with the Lord's Supper. And I got to turn this. And we covered that in your Doctrines of the Bible class, or booklet last week. And we'll go on from here. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 17, we'll read it in Greek and then we'll, we'll take it apart in, in, uh, in English. Uh, all of you can read that first word, I know. Hote. Ace. Artos. Han. Soma. Hoi, Haloi, Esmen, Hoi, Gar, Pontes, Ek, Tu, Hinos, Artu, Metekomen. All right. It's talking about the uh, participants and it's talking about the uh, elements of the Lord's Supper. How many, uh, how many ordinances do we have in God's churches today? What are the two? What what are the ordinances? What? Baptism. Baptism that's one. Lord's and the Lord's Supper is the other ordinance. All right. These are ordinances. Brother Lee is one of our ordained elders here at Valley Baptist Church, and you would help him administer the Lord's Supper pretty often, don't you, Brother Lee? Yeah. And uh, the ordained help. Ordained. What? Ordinances and ordain, what does that mean, ordained? An ordinance. What does that mean? Think a little bit. What does it mean? Something set down in law. Something set down as fact. We're going to see it a little bit later in this book. All right here, but it means something that is set down. There are two ordinances in the Lord's Church, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And uh, there are uh, two ordained groups, ordained types of people in those churches. Who are the ones that are ordained? Who are they? Brother Lee? Pastors and the deacons. Pastors and deacons. Pastors and deacons, okay. And they're the ones that administer the ordinances in those churches. They administer the ordinances in those churches. Sometimes, uh, Dr. Carl E. Farah, one of my teachers, he uh, was crippled since he was five years old. And uh, he felt the call to the ministry very early in his life. He was saved early. And he felt a call to the ministry early in his life. And he thought that he'd become a Methodist because Methodists just sprinkled a little water. And he could do that because he didn't think he was ever going to be strong enough to immerse somebody in water. Then he got to study in the Word of God and realized that uh, sprinkling and pouring just wasn't the right mode of baptism. And he became a pastor. And uh, I don't know whether he ever... Or, baptized anyone <laughs> but the deacons the ordained ministers deacons in the church did the baptism for him all right because one bread one artos ace ace artos artos now in modern greek today that word artos there is not does not mean bread that mean this means holy bread to them because it's in the bible the Greek language has uh, evolved. We know that early in the Greek, way, way back in uh, time unknown, there was what we call the Greek dialects. And each one of those dialects finally got together and made up classical Greek. This is 2000 plus BC, okay? Then by the time of uh, Alexander the Great, Alexander the Great conquered the known world basically at that time. And the whole world back there spoke one language. And that was Koine Greek. 
Koine Greek. What does Koine Greek mean? Koine Greek. You remember what Koine means? Brother, Brother Lee, you remember what that word means? Koine. What does Koine mean? Mm -hmm. Koine onion. We got a word communion from it. What does it mean? Common. In common. Thank you, brother. <laughs> That's the common language of the world. From 330 B.C. to 330 A.D., we have the Koine Greek as a language of Europe. The Romans had Latin. The Spanish, you know, speaking, basically, that was Spanish came from Latin. And we have French, we have Germanic languages, all these languages. There are basically there's four language groups in, in Europe. But Greek was the legal language of the world from 330 B.C. to 330 A.D. The Catholic Church had caught on by that time, and they changed the language out of the common man. The New Testament is written in Greek that we have, okay? And every man knew Greek. That was a language of commerce and everything. When Jesus was crucified, what three languages did Pontius Pilate write with his own hand above the cross of Calvary? What? He wrote in Latin? and in Greek and in Hebrew. Hebrew, because these were the Hebrews, he knew Hebrew, by the way. And of course he knew Latin because he was Roman. But the language of the world was Greek, so he wrote it in Greek. Okay, he wrote it in those three languages. All right. It was about the cross, because that was illegal. He was forced to crucify the king of the Jews. He was forced to. He tried five times to turn him free turn him loose. They would not. They demanded that he kill him and murder him. They wanted him killed. And he finally said to them, he said he took a bowl of water and what did he do? He washed his hands and he said, let his blood be upon you and your children. And what did they say and scream in unison? Let his blood be upon us and our children. And has it been? It will be. It will be to right here. They're going to pay for it during through here. The whole tribulation period, the whole reason for that is what? Mainly to bring Israel back to God. They're not with God today. They're in the land. They want all, they look upon the Bible and look upon Jehovah God as their uh, license to be in the land. They use it as a license. But they don't follow him. All right. The bread. It's talking about the artos. The word artos means mixed. And what is the communion bread made out of? It's a mix of what? Flour and water. Nothing else. No, not not salt. Not uh, no leaven at all. Okay. Flour and water. A mix of flour and water. That's what it was. One bread and one body. Now. In the early churches, each church took the Lord's Supper as a body of believers right there, a local, visible New Testament church. And they would take one loaf of bread, and they would break that piece of bread up and issue it out to each church member in that church. All right? And they had one cup. And where did it come from? Where did this ordinance come from? Where did it come from? Hmm? It came from the Passover. Who's, whose bread was it? Whose bread was it? Whose piece of bread was that? Huh? Who was piece of bread? Elijah. Elijah's bread. Thank you, Brother Lee. So you remember this thing. <coughs> That's what basically, that's what the Jewish people say. They would say over the bread. All right. It says, uh, blessed are you, O Jehovah. Jehovah. All right. That's what it says. Adonai, they always put the name Adonai in place of Jehovah, but it's talking about Jehovah. It's talking about the covenant God of Israel. Blessed are you. O Jehovah, 
our God, Eloheinu, maker of the heaven and the earth. All right? Maker of the heaven and the earth, ruler of the universe, who brings forth bread out of the Haaretz, out of the earth. Out of the earth. That's what they would say. And they would break the bread and they would eat the Passover. All right? Now, the uh, the Passover dinner, remember last, this is a review from last week now, okay? What did Jesus change drastically and diametrically different? The Passover was a what kind of a feast? It was a family feast where the family taught the family members, the young people, they would have the person that asked the question, why? And then they would repeat the question, you know, the, and they would, they'd ask, the, the youngest one in the family would ask the questions, they'd repeat all this stuff, and it would tell the whole history, the history of, the, of Israel being brought into bondage and everything else. Now, now, Jesus completely changes the whole plan. He takes it away from the family. Jesus, in his ministry, shows that the family is not as important a unit as what? Ecclesia. Huh? Ecclesia. As the ecclesia. Brother Lee did a, uh, <coughs> about 12, 13 years ago, you did a little, got up in front of the class and he told them about the ecclesia, what the ecclesia was, the church. And all, we, he looked at it and, and read it from all the different sources, the, the history of the word ecclesia and everything else. The ecclesia, the church, the kingdom of God is much superior to the family. Some of your members of your family aren't going to be with you in eternity. But you're going to be putting up with the church, the members of the ecclesia for all eternity. That's different. That's an eternal proposition. That's an eternal proposition. He took the authority to teach the word of God out of each Jewish home and put it in the church. All right? And he put this ordinance in the church, not in the family anymore. Not in the family, but in the church. Now he took Elijah's cup, one cup. The one cup represented the one Christ. And the one bread represented Christ and then the one body of believers there. Okay? Now we have the one cup. Now we've changed that because of modern tradition. We, we've changed the cup to many cups. But he took the cup, all right? And used to, churches were small enough to where they would get up there, the deacons would come forward and they'd bring this one cup and everybody would, they would take their bread, they would, they would eat their bread, they would uh, have a blessing over the bread, and then they would bless the cup. And what they would say in Hebrew was, Barak Atah, uh, El, uh, Jehovah, Elohinu, Melech Ha'alam Bore Pri Hagagin. Blessed you are, O Jehovah our God, ruler of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Ganamato Seisam Plu in Greek. Ganamato Seisam Plu in Greek. And they would come around, each member, and they would take it and they'd take a drink of that cup out of the same cup. Because that cup represents our Lord and Savior. We only have one way of salvation, one way of salvation. And it was one body of believers taking this ordinance. Now we've changed. We do things a little different. All right? The, uh, one body, the many we are, we are many members in one church, but we're in one body of believers. Okay? For the ones all out of the one bread we partake, out of one piece of bread. Now, let's look at one other thing now. When Jesus was at this Passover dinner, did he pick a piece of the lamb up? Why did he pick a piece of the lamb up? Because the last lamb had been sacrificed. That was part of the old covenant, wasn't it? Every year, every year, when they take up Elijah's cup, they would say what? Brother Roger, next year in Jerusalem, 
But this time he said what? I will not partake of this communion with you, this supper with you again to win. I come to my kingdom. And they were all messed They thought the kingdom was coming right then. They couldn't see all of this whole church age and the tribulation period and all of this ahead of his kingdom. Now, right here, you know, there is going to be a rapture. First Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, they're going to go up. The church is going to be have a seven-year wedding festival while they're having hell on earth down here on the tribulation period. And Israel gets to get beat up a little bit, and then he, Israel comes back to God. Then he comes back and saves them out of all of that one more time. Israel will never be the bride again. Did you know that? Israel done. They rejected their husband. We live in an age today that we can be part of that bride. A very special thing for all eternity. Let's go on a little bit. For many we are. Out of one bread we partake. Jesus did not pick up a piece of the lamb which was there but the type was completed. He picked up the bread and the wine to confirm a new memorial. We talked last week about transubstantiation. Transubstantiation, what is that? Transubstantiation. Where the, bread huh? and the, wine into the, the bread and the wine turn into the literal body of Jesus. And the Catholic Church will tell those, their communicants they're little kids in, in, in catechism. If you don't believe that this really literally turns into the body and blood of Jesus, then you're not going to be saved. And, of course, Calvin and Luther came out of work. The Catholic Church. And so they brought it in, and what is their idea now? They dropped off and left off a little bit of transubstantiation. What do they believe in? Come on, this is the test. Consubstantiation. Consubstantiation, which means what? What does consubstantiation mean? What? Uh, that's what we that's what we practice. He's there spirit, okay. Isn't it? What? That, he's there in that he is there, in that bread, and, and that he's actually they're taking partaking of Christ, but he's there, but it's not liter he's not literally there. Okay. Now the other, the last number three is it's a memorial. It's symbolic only. We take it up as a memorial of Christ only. That's what we practice as Baptists for 2,000 years. It's a memorial. It is not Jesus' blood and it is not Jesus' body. But it symbolizes his what? His death until he returns. That he died for us. All right. 10 and verse 18. 10 and verse 18. Blepete. Ton Israel, Karasarka, Uk, Hoi, Estenontes, Tos, Theseos, Kononioi, Tu, Theasa, Teru. All right. Look here, he says, all of you. Look, you all. That's what he said. That's uh, second person plural, pre present indicative active. Look, you all. Keep on looking, you all. The Israel, according to the flesh. Israel, kata sarka, kata sarka. Every time I look at the word sarks, I remember John 1.14. Who can read John 1.14? Who can quote it for in Greek for me? John 1.14. Kai. Kai hologo sarks againito. And the word, the Jehovah, flesh, he became for himself and dwelt among us. All right? Now, Israel, according to the sarks, the flesh, is who? Literal Israel. The people of Israel. According to the flesh. Israel, according to the flesh. Not the ones eating the sacrifices, sharers of the sacrificial altar, aren't they? Uh, Penny. Do you have that in your Amplified Bible right now? Could you come and read uh, number uh, 17 and 18 for me? Is, can you do that? Bounce up here a little bit. Oops. For we, no matter how numerous we are, are one body, 
Because we all partake of the one bread, the one whom the communion bread represents, consider those physically people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices partners of the altar united in their worship of the same God? All right. Thank you, Penny. Israel were given, Israel was given the administration of the kingdom of God. Israel offered over, was offered over and over and over again the keys to that kingdom, were they not? When Jesus was on earth, who, who did he come to? Israel. All right. Over and over and again. Remember what he said to the, the Samaritan woman and remember the Syrophoenician woman and all these different ones? The one woman came and says, uh, Lord, Lord. And he said, I haven't come to you. We don't cast our pearls before swine, etc. And she said, yes, but even the puppies eat from the crumbs from the master's table. And he said, oh boy, you have such great faith. I have not seen that faith where? In Israel. <clears throat> Many times over, the, the uh, Gentiles believed and that church would become a Gentile church. Remember we talked about uh, when we did, the, how many of you were with me when I taught the book of Genesis? All right. Ham, Sham, and Japheth. Ham, Sham, and Japheth. All right. Noah made a prophecy when Ham sinned. He made a prophecy. And uh, later on, Abraham, Brother Lee called me last night and asked me about Abraham. Abraham, how many wives did Abraham have? How many wives did Abraham have? Two, two legal ones. Abraham had how many? How many? It was a four or five. No, how many wives did he have? How, no. How many wives did Abraham, Brother Mike? One. How many wives did he have? <laughs> Come on, you guys now. How many? Three. One Shemite, one Hamite, and one Japhethite. All right? Who was a Shemite? Who was a Shemite? Sarah. Sarah. Who was a Hamite? Hagar. Who was a Japhethite? Keturah. All right, there you are. We are all related to Abraham according to the flesh even. Okay? There in the book of Genesis, he cursed Canaan. Not Ham, but he cursed Canaan. because And, and they were going to become slaves of slaves. Slaves to slaves. The land of Canaan was going to be Israel's land. He, this was way back yonder. There back at the flood. Okay? Just after the flood, this happened. And he said that uh, Canaan would be a servant of servants, a servant below servants. Okay? And he said uh, Japheth would spread. Every place Ham went, Japheth would follow. And what would happen? In the last days that... Japheth would dwell in the tents of what? Of Shem. What would they do? The church would become a Japhethite church in the last days. It was offered to Israel, and all of the first members basically were Jewish. But Israel would reject the kingdom. They would reject the ecclesia. And they would be set aside nationally. And he would turn to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles would carry out the gospel until the end times. That's where we were in. The, we're living in the age of the Gentiles today in the church age. All right? The greatest writers in, in the world in, in, in history were the Japhethites, by the way. The Germans. were the greatest writers and greatest theologians at that time that have been handed down to us today. Ye see that Israel, according to the flesh, not the ones eating the sacrifices, the sharers, ones in common with a sacrificial altar. Our lamb, the last lamb, 
was sacrificed. We don't look to lamb anymore. We don't look to another sacrifice. We only have one sacrifice. Now, the Catholic Church sacrifices the Lord every time they have communion, don't they? They put him back on the cross. He's always on a crucifix. Some Christians have a cross, but the Catholics have a crucifix because they have Jesus being sacrificed continually. The word Thyatira in the book of Revelation, it talked, that's when the church, the Catholic Church became. Thyatira means what? Continual sacrifice. And that's when the Catholic Church, that's when they, the, uh, the doctrine during that period of time in church history is when the doctrine of, of the uh, continual sacrifice and transubstantiation was created. Okay? 10 and verse 19. Paul says, quote me. <laughs> he says, quote me. T, un, fe me. Hote, I do lo the tone. T, Eston, A, Hote, I do lo, T, Eston. Okay. heart hammered me. <laughs> I'll be all right in a minute, maybe. <laughs> <clears throat> what therefore I say, fame me, fame me. On page uh, 651 in Thayer and page 424 in the analytical Greek lexicon, fame me is different. What kind of words we have for word and speak in Greek? We have a lot of them, don't we? This one's very special. We have rail. We have Lego, we have La Leo, okay? These are some of the words. <coughs> Lego means what? To set in a row. It means to pick out words and set them in a row. What is the Hebrew equivalent to Lego? Devar. Brother Roger. Devar. Devar. All right. Devar means a row of fence poles, whatever else. We have the word word from that. Okay, in John 1 and 1, that's where that comes from, is from that word, the bar. Every time you see the name of, of Jehovah in the Old Testament, even when they, in the blessing, it'll come to him and they will say, Hashem or Ha the bar, the word of the name of God. That's his personal name, okay? And that's where the bar and Lego means the same thing. Lego and the bar means the same thing. It means a set in a row. It means to speak. It means to put words in a row. That's what Lego. What does La Leo mean? La Leo. La Leo. What does that mean? La Leo. La. Leo. Lego. Okay. What does La Leo mean? That means to speak with your tongue, your mouth, all of your abilities to speak. That's what it means. This means in human language, to speak in human language. Lego. And then Lareo. What does that mean? That means to flow. Okay? To flow or to make a speech. All right? Now we come to the word Fiamme. Fia me means uh, to utter. To utter. This was a pagan word. The, uh, the priests and the priestesses in the pagan world would make utterances. Utterances. Oracles. This word means I make an oracle. Okay, I make an oracle. I make an utterance. I make an oracle. Or he says, quote me. This also means a quotation. In Greek history, if you go all the way back in Liddell and Scott and Thayer, you'll find out it means it it means a quotation. This is a speech. This is an oracle. It is a a document that's valid. It's a valid communication. It's like a signpost out, like a wanted poster. I've got a little tiny head, just in case you don't know it. 
I wear a size six and a half hat. That's little, okay? Uh, this one is six and three quarters, and see, I've got it all pasted up inside because I couldn't find any one smaller. Six and five eighths fits better, but I still have to put paper in them, like that little girl did on the True Grip, okay? In here it says John B. Stetson Company. John B. Stetson Company, made in USA. It's a Stetson hat. Now, John B. Stetson, he was a young man. He had tuberculosis. Consumption is what they called it. Uh, we know some very famous people in history with a consumption, and John B. Stetson is one of the most famous ones. Doc Holliday was one. John Henry Holliday. Okay? And he went out west. When they would get tuberculosis back east, they should go west where it's dry. Well, John B. Stetson went west, and he became what? Dakota. He became a gold miner and he got fooling around up in Colorado and it rains hard in Colorado and he got to watching out there and got to looking at all of these cowboys running around with all different kinds of weird looking hats on. Every kind of hat, every floppy hat and everything. He said they used to even wear coonskin hats out there hurting cattle. He said the lice and the ticks would get in those coonskin hats and they would carry in their vermin with them. Carry them transporting it. <laughs> he said, you know what? He said, if I go back home, he said, I, I know what I'm going to do. I, first of all, I want a hat that's going to keep the rain off of my noggin. So he got a hat and he put a real high crown on it, big high crown. Now, originally, see, this is a, what they call the John Wayne crown or whatever you want to call it. It usually was up here like this. And, and why did they put a tall crown in the hat for originally? Remember why he, he, he put that tall crown he they used to call those 10-gallon hats or whatever? You know why it was there? Well, they did all kinds of stuff. For The number one thing it, before was air space between your head and the outside. And it was warm in the wintertime and cooler in the summer. And if you needed it, you could use it for a bucket. And if you needed it, you could. it was big enough, had a wide enough brim to keep the rain off of you and whatever anyway. And everybody, after a while, wanted a verified, certified John B. Stetson hat. And it would have different X's in it. See, this one here's got a bunch of X's in there. That's how high grade it was. He went and bought $100 worth of felt, got him a factory going. He, he became the biggest hat maker in the world. He had over 5,000 employees, and by the way, Henry Ford took after John B. Stetson. Did you know that? John B. Stetson, he was a Baptist. How many of you knew John B. Stetson was a Baptist? He was a real good Baptist man. He had principles. And he took his Baptist principles to his workplace with him. The hat makers, the hatters, were a very unreliable bunch. He couldn't, they couldn't keep anybody in one job. They'd just go from one place to the other, from one place to the other. Besides that, they had mercury poisoning, you know, like me. <laughs> and they would go plumb nuts, and they were wild and whatever, you know. And so it was, it was a, an unreliable trade. He said, if I am going to get, a, a, if I'm going to build the biggest hat factory in the world, and everybody wanted John B. Stetson verified, certified hat, had gold letters in it, just like it does today. He said, if I'm going to be the, the greatest hat builder in the world, maker, I'm going to have to have reliable employees. So I'm going to build them homes. I'm going to build them schools. I'm going to build them a hospital. I'm going to give them free health care, and I'm going to give them housing, and nobody's going to be poor. He brought those church principles and put it right in his hat, in his hat-making company. When Henry Ford came on the line, he started making the Model T Ford. Guess what Henry Ford did? He copied Stetson. And he built hospitals. And he built villages where his people were. He built factory. He gave them free health care. The first mental health care Henry Ford provided for his people. Because you'd sit there on the assembly line and doing the same thing over and over again and drive you stir crazy. Same way with hat making. All right, let's go back. Figure me. That is a legend. 
Femi is a legend. What the Apostle Paul writes here in the book of 1 Corinthians is legendary, is it not? John B. Stetson made a legendary hat. And they're still making them today. Nine years after he died, they were still making over a million hats a year and over 5,500 employees, and they were steadfast employees. I'm going to tell you something about God's Word. It is steadfast. It is absolutely reliable. When John V. Stetson built a hat, it wouldn't fall apart in the first rain. It was made out of the finest felt. It was verified to be good. Religion. Some religion just damns you. Many religions are, are, are built upon what? Works, mainly. What you do. True religion is built upon what Jesus did, okay? And true religion is built upon a set of rules that are verifiable, and, and our religion is what? The Word of God. Our rules are the Word of God. That's what we go by. That's verifiable. The Word of God is verifiable. It is true. When I got saved and finally gave my life to the Lord. There's a whole lot of religions out there in the world, isn't there? A lot of confusion. It's religious Babylon. So I sat down and did a lot of thinking, and I said, you know something, I better learn the rules, the instruction manual, that's the Bible. And then there are a whole lot of translations of the Bible, aren't there? So I said, maybe I better learn Greek and Hebrew, because the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. New Testament written in Greek, maybe I ought to do that. And I want to tell you something. Don't ever be afraid to study deep in God's Word. All it's going to do is make you stronger. You will never make a flake out of you, and you will never fall off when you study the Word of God. Many religions, they get to studying. <clears throat> I know many people in Catholicism. What's Catholicism founded on? What's the belief, beliefs in Catholicism founded on? Dogmas and traditions, and whatever revelation the Holy Papa gives us this, this, this year, okay? The Word of God is, is, it is foundational, it is settled. <laughs> Not going to change. It's already finished. Already finished. The Catholic Church over the years have evolved in their thinking. You remember when the, in history when the Catholic Church said that the earth was flat? Remember that? Does the Bible say the earth's flat? Did it ever say the earth was flat? Never. The holy dogma, the holy papa, the bulls, the issue from the, from the pope over there said the earth was flat. The earth, he also said the earth was the middle of the universe. And everything evolved around the earth. Is that what the Bible teaches? Is not. Talks about all the constellations out there, all the different things in an orbit. You want to go back and read an old book, go back and read the book of Enoch. You want to talk about stars and heavens and stuff and how that God set them, or the book of Job, or Psalms. You go back and see if you've got a flat earth in any of those books. When uh, Columbo Christophus Colombo. We call him as Christopher Columbus now. When he took off, the Catholic Church still thought the earth was flat. And they didn't put much stock in what he believed. He thought the earth was, was little. He thought he could sail around it and go over there and, and find China because they wanted to find things in China. China was the greatest empire in the world at that time. They had... They, the Chinese, they looked at the rest of the world. In, in 1390 to 1405, they had the greatest armada in the world. The Ming Dynasty had uh, an uh, armada that was 317 ships. One of them was over 300 feet long and 150 feet wide. They had double hulls. They had mechanical bilge pumps. They had rust-proof nails. All of this. 
before Europe could even hardly build a canoe. Okay? And when they'd come up to some land, they'd think the world was coming to an end. They thought a new, a new it was such a big armada, they thought a new continent had just arrived. Wherever the Ming Dynasty went, they looked and they found nothing that they wanted when any other land. They thought the Europeans were the most ignorant, dumbest, filthiest, stinkingest people that ever walked the face of the earth. There was nothing there they wanted. Finally, when the Spanish discovered uh, silver at Mount Potosi bound in South America, they decided they wanted some of that because they didn't have enough precious metals for their money. So then they started trading. And Christopher Columbus comes on the scene. He said, I can, I can sail over there to China. I'll go around the other way. The earth is really round. looks like an egg. Okay? And, uh, and I'm going to go around there. And I'm going to go and, and I'll find a short way to China. We, we will we'll get there. Well, and meanwhile, he ran into America. And those people, those Catholics, when they came to America, they had a hard time believing how these Indians got here. The Indians didn't have any problem with them Europeans over there because they figured that God made them somehow or another sometime. But they didn't know what in the world these people over here were, or the continents. They run into these cities that were clean and spick and span, like clean. They couldn't believe it. Brother Lee was talking to me about that last night. They came in the cities down there and they couldn't believe. In Europe, the cities were the street city streets were open sewers and the filth and disease. And here the people were so healthy and the streets were clean. Nobody was hungry. There wasn't any poor and there wasn't any super rich. They did have rulers, but everybody was on the... They ran down there in the, this one socialist society down in South America. And you know what they saw? Everybody had enough food. They had so much food that it was in great big storages. Said, what are you doing with all this food? What are you doing with all this food? And in all reality, not one person ever starved to death on this earth because there wasn't enough food. It's because somebody else had it all. <laughs> had control over it. All right. Quote me, he says. Quote me. And I say, this is quotable. This is an edict. This is an utterance. This is an oracle that idle sacrifice is nothing it is or that idols anything it is each one of them that's third person singular present in dignity of active each one of those essence there is no such thing as an idol sacrifice it is no an idol is what what is an idol by the way what is it it's an image of some imaginary god okay and Israel was told by Jehovah God, don't you make any images of me. Don't you do that. Don't do it. As a matter of fact, when God, through Moses, uttered, you shall not use the Lord thy God's name in vain, they was afraid to speak the name Jehovah. So they didn't from that time on. They didn't speak the name Jehovah. Prayed to. All right. 10 and verse 20. Heathenism is an about face departure from God. Al Hote Ha Thusin Ta Ethne. Now Ta Ethne is in brackets, so it's not really there, but it's a practical substance. It's understood. Diamonios Kai U Thu Thusin U Thelo De Himas Kononos Tone, daimonion, geneste. But that the thing they sacrifice, they continually sacrifice, these heathens, demons, to demons, daimonios. What is a demon? Daimonia. What does demon mean? Remember what demon means? What is demon? It really means little God. Little God or a lesser God. It is a supernatural being. When somebody bows down and worships a rock, there is a demon in that rock. Did you know that? 
That's what's drawing them there. There's a demon in the rock. Anybody picks up a statue of Christopher or whatever and kisses it or Mary, there is a demon in that statue that is drawing them to it. There is a real demonic entity there. There is a supernatural being. It is a lesser God, but it is a supernatural being. When back in the eternity, when God created the, God created the angels and the spirits, they were there. Some place back yonder, after God created the heavens and the earth then, we find that they rebelled against God. Lucifer was over one group of angels, evidently. Lucifer means what? Light carrier. Seraphim means what? Fire. Fire. Seraphim. The seraphim, the teraphim, all right? And the cherubim, all of these are different orders of angels, okay? The seraphim and the cherubim cherubim is plural we have two cherubim right there over the Ark of the Covenant don't we with their wings out toward him cherubim have wings too cherub okay seraphim means burning ones bright ones powerful ones and there are spirits there are angels and these different orders of angels and then there are spirits in the spirit realm okay if I tell you this long enough, you'll go, you're going to know this. You know that? <laughs> if I tell you enough times, you'll learn it. Eventually. Amen? <laughs> One third of the angelic forces, probably not all out of Lucifer's realm, some out of Michael and some out of Gabriel's, but uh, one third of all the angels rebelled and fell. And then we believe that one third of the spiritual forces fell. So we got one third of the spirits and one third of the angels which became bad. Fallen ones. Okay? That's the daimonia. That's the demons. Spirits minister to us, don't they? Spirits minister to us. They minister, the spirits minister to our spirits. We have ministering angels, we have uh, protective angels, we have guardian angels, and we have guardian spirits. Okay? that protect us. Well, there's also a lot of demons out there influencing people. If a person hears the Word of God, and the Word of God is the, the way of salvation, then, Brother Lee, you go over and preach the Word of God all over the world. Over in Africa? Where was the last place you went? El Salvador. El Salvador. Now, every place that you've gone here, do you see a little demon activity? Not every place. But yeah. You ever, you ever go down there to any convicts down there, any outlaws, any of those places? Sometimes, yeah. What do you think? Uh, I'll turn this antique over just in case everything else fails. Maybe it'll get it. What do you think makes people outlaws, makes people want to be outlaws? The spiritual realm. Wars and rumors of wars and wars all over the world. Some place there's a war going on all over the world, isn't there? All the time. What's behind all of those wars? Angels and demons. On all sides. Angels and demons. All right. In all idol sacrifices and all false religion, in every false religion in the world, there are demons that draw them. God draws you with his spirit and he seals you with his spirit. You're born again, you're born from above and you've sealed with the spirit. You're sealed unto the resurrection. You're branded, you're earmarked for the resurrection when that spirit of God comes in you and you will never lose it. It doesn't mean that you're not going to be influenced by demons after you're saved. You can be. You can be pestered by them. You can be pestered by the devil if he thinks you're important enough. I always knew where he was. He's right behind me. <laughs> <laughs> all my life <clears throat> heathenism is an about face away from a departure from God Romans 1 19 through 23 but that the thing they sacrifice the nations to is to demons and not to God they have a religion don't they what does the word religion mean brother Lee you mean don't remember what religion means religion 
He used to teach English etymology a long time ago. Re means what? Back. Back or again. What does leg, le, leg uh, comes from legere, Latin, and we get our word ligament. What does ligament do? What does a ligament do? When you get a torn ligament, it tears from a bone. It binds bones together, doesn't it? It binds. Okay, it binds. And then the uh, ion is a suffix, and that means the act of. The act of. Now look at it again. The act of binding back again. False religion will bind you away from God, not to God. It will capture you, and you're captured. In the cults in the world today, if you ever escape from a cult, you it's a miracle. When you get out of a cult, if you've been saved out of a cult, it's a miracle of God because you had demon forces working on you and holding you there, binding you there. Okay? All right, demons, not to the God. They sacrifice. Not I wish and you the fellowship of the demons to become for yourselves. Don't. Now this, by the way, is quoted from uh, the Septuagint. What's the Septuagint? Remember what Septuagint is? It's not quoted from Hebrew, now it's quoted from the Septuagint. That's a Greek t translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. This is quoted from the Septuagint in, in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 17. You are sacrificing to a no God, and you are a no people. You're a no God with a no people. A no God and a no people. When the, when the Lord Jesus Christ saves us, we are saved to a real God, and we become a real people, a very important people. A very important people. Psalm 106 and 37, Galatians 4 and 8, 1 Timothy 4 and 1, Revelation 9 and 20 are cross references to this. Verse number 21. Ooh. Dinaste. Poterion. Curio. Penane. Kai. Poterion. Demonion. Ooh. Dinaste. Dinaste. Trapezes. Curio. Matekin, Kai, Trapezes, Trapezes, that is, and Daimonion. Not ye ever, not ye are able to cup the cup. The cup is uh, the one cup in the church that held the wine that they passed around. I'm going to tell you something. On that table, on that Passover table, there were many cups, weren't they? But this one cup we have is Elijah's cup. And every year at the end of this dinner, they would raise, they would break Elijah's bread, they would pass it out, they would take Elijah's cup, and they would say, what? Next year in Jerusalem. And Jesus said, not again. I will partake of this dinner with you, this common dinner with you, until I come into my kingdom. Till I come into my kingdom. Never again was there ever a valid Passover dinner ever taken. It was nullified. Never again was there ever a valid Jewish festival celebrated. They were all nullified. They were all nullified. Elijah had come, had he not. Elijah. Elijah was the one that would point the way to the Lord. And he prepared the way for the Lord. And who was that Elijah? Who did Jesus say he was? John the Baptist. And Elijah was a friend of the bridegroom. In the Old Testament, who was a friend of the bridegroom? Who was the type of Elijah in the Old Testament? Who was he? Come on, fellas. Dig it up. Who was the type of the Elijah in the Old, Old Testament? Abraham's servant, Eliezer, when he sent him to find Isaac a wife. Isaac a wife. He was a friend of the bridegroom. He got nothing out of it. He was a friend of the bridegroom. He had no inheritance. He was a friend of the bridegroom. And he went and he found that little old girl, and what was her name? Rebecca. Probably the little red-haired princess. What does Rebecca mean? What does Rebecca mean? Remember what Rebecca means? Huh? It means haltered or lassoed. The lasso and hog time. 
She was so beauty that she hogtied, she lassoed, she stole everyone's heart that looked upon her. All right. 10.22. No, wait a minute. Go back to 10.21. Not ye are able the cup of the Lord to drink and the cup of demons. The cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You can't mix false religion with truth, can you? You can't mix the world with the truth. It doesn't work. If you... Uh, if you take... A little mercury and a little arsenic, just a little bit, and put it in a cup. And then you strain it back out. You try to. How much of that cup or the water in that cup or the grape juice or whatever you want to put it, how much of it is contaminated? All of it. I'm going to tell you something. You don't want to drink mercury and arsenic. <laughs> I'm suffering for that business. That's a rough way. Now in Mount Potosi in South America, they, they, when they enslaved those Indians down there and sent them into the Mount Potosi and that other place where they had the mercury cinnabar, those poor Indians would go down there and they'd come out after one shift and they'd be shake all over and their body would just shake and shiver from the mercury poisoning. I can tell you how that feels. How much of that cup when you contaminate it is contaminated? The cup and everything in it. The cup and everything in it. How much of the world can we bring into a church without contaminating it? How much false religion can we bring in a church without contaminating it? To drink the cup of demons. Not there's an adverbic negation there, that word ooh. That comes from ooh, remember, page 294. Not you're able, a uh, table, a uh, trapezes. We got a word trapeze from that word. Trapeze is you balance on the trapeze. You get up on balance on trapeze. And they, there are trapeze artists that jump from trapeze to trapeze, don't they? But the trapeze is held up by a stand. A table is held up by a stand. Okay, trapeze. The table. The table of the Lord. The table of the Lord is founded upon what? The Word of God. The Word of God. And it says metekin. It That word metekin comes from meta and echo. That means to with half. To mix, to with half. We can't mix the cup of demons and the table of the Lord with the world can we? What happens? It's contaminated. It's contaminated. And the table of demons. Uh, Penelope. Do you think you could come up and read this last couple of three verses? Uh, can you do that for me? From uh, the Amplified Bible. Up here to verse number 21. Up to verse number 21. Oh, uh, was it? I think it was uh, 18 to 21. Read 18 to 21. 18 to 21. <clears throat> uh, consider those physically people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices partners of the altar united in their worship of the same God? What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is intrinsically changed by the fact and amounts to nothing or that an idol itself is a living thing? No, I am suggesting that what the pagans sacrifice, they offer in effect to demons, to evil spiritual powers, and not to God at all. I do not want you to fellowship and be partners with diabolical spirits by eating at their feasts. 21. You cannot drink the Lord's cup and the demon's cup. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the demon's table. All right. Separation. Separation. What did God tell Abraham? What did he tell him? Get out of here. Get out of there. Come down in the land of Canaan, which God had promised Noah that the Shemites would have. Way back there. He promised Noah that the Shemites would have this land. Way back there. The, the Word of God is beautiful. The promises go all the way back to the first chapters of Genesis. The book of Genesis lays all the foundation for the Word of God. All right. 
Well, the Lord willing, and I live that long, we'll start out 1022 next time. We started at uh, 1017, and we went to 1017 to 1021. What? Well, I'm going to see if they'll let me come next week. I don't know whether they will or not. All right, if you want to come, you can come. Uh, I'll try to be here. I'm trying to get every class that I can do <laughs> before I croak. I'm going to tell you something. Standing up here sometimes tonight, I like the one on my face two or three times. My heart was hammering me. <laughs> but I made it one more time. Thank the Lord for that. That's why I'm staying alive here. Uh, Brother Roger, would you come up here and dismiss us in prayer? Now, when you go out there to do something eternal, carry this with you. Remember what you've been taught and teach it to others. Carry it on. Father, thank you for allowing us to assemble here tonight to hear your word. Thank you for the ability of Dr. Phillips to interpret your word and put it in a way that's meaningful and creates an understanding for us. I pray that you'll be with him and his physical ailments, and I pray that you'll be with all of us as we leave here and go forth. Guide us and direct us in your will and way. In your name, amen. Amen. There's still some hot sauce over there and chips, I think, and some cookies if you want some. Brother Lee, thank you for being here tonight. Good to have you here.